The Artibonite River flows down into a physically magnificent valley, but the effects of the precious irrigation project have gone to the enrichment of the privileged few. There are four and a quarter million people living in Haiti, and 97% are peasants. The good soil has gone to the favored government officials, or the elite of the mulatto class. Haiti becomes poorer and apparently less well governed year by year. A quarter million people live in this valley, and medical observers claim that nearly all are hungry. Certainly all are suffering from some kind of malnutrition. Eight to 12 people sleep in an eight by 12 foot hut. One of them may have active tuberculosis. All windows and doors are tightly closed at night to keep out the evil spirits. On the good soil, a man can earn 75 cents to a dollar a day if he works from dawn to sunset cutting the rich man's sugar. It's a help if your wife can bind the king. This woman sings an old hymn in her native Creole. Prepare yourself, she says. Prepare yourself for the better life. The day of the Lord is coming. In the same valley too, what some call the modern miracle of Haiti, the Albert Schweitzer Hospital, set up single-handedly by Dr. Larry Mellon, the grandson of one of America's greatest capitalists. All of Dr. Mellon's material wealth has gone into the best hospital in the country. Canada, through the Mennonite Church Mission, has contributed milk, the greatest therapy here. And there are five missionary sisters of the Immaculate Conception with headquarters in Montreal. Nearly all the patients are suffering from chronic malaria. Their life expectancy is 33 years. The infant mortality rate is 50%. Some patients walked for two days through the hills to get here, and almost all believe in voodoo and witchcraft. Their superstition, their belief in the supernatural has burdened them. For instance, they believe that cow's milk is too strong for babies who've just been weaned. Goat's milk is no good for babies at all. Bananas and oranges shouldn't be eaten by children because they're cold foods. A person with jaundice must not cross a river. But today, more and more, they say that Dr. Larry's magic needle will cure anything. Dr. Duvalier has his good works too, but no one knows when the people will benefit from them. He builds, but slowly and few have yet been allowed to live in houses. From time to time, there's an occasion like this when half a dozen families are granted deeds, but the new homes generally remain unoccupied, although they've been there for more than a year. Troops on occasions like this are always on hand to keep the peasants in line. Most feared in Haiti, however, are Dr. Duvalier's personal terrorist organization, the Ragtag Tonton Maku, Creole for boogeymen. They can and do kill on the basis of suspicion alone. In their headquarters, I was told that if Duvalier dies, everyone dies. And a government official told me that the Tonton, in time of danger, is to counterbalance or destroy the untrustworthy army. In Port-au-Prince, it's been almost business as usual. The Tonton Maku, of course, is more than vigilant. And when the curfew rings at night, the streets are deserted. Still, during the day, the shops are open and the merchants are finding it harder to sell wares. Haitians have been withdrawing their deposits from Haitian banks and depositing them with the biggest Canadian investment in the country, the Royal Bank of Canada. 60% of the people have no work, so the streets are filled with lottery vendors and beggars. 
Observers wonder whether the country would collapse of itself without American money and aid. I found the Haitians generally a, a kind and considerate people, and like people the world over, they have a national sport, and I found that they loved to gamble. On almost any afternoon of the week, there's a chance to bet on the cocks. Peasants and the well-heeled come from miles around to match their birds and wager. It's not as bloody as you might expect. The rules vary from day to day. The contest might be decided on a time limit, cowardice by one of the birds, but of course, preferably dead. And the Haitians have some refinements of their own to add to the spectacle. The biggest organized struggle in Haiti concerns the Roman Catholic Church and the state. Dr. Duvalier is one of the country's great students of voodoo, and he's understood to believe that certain spirits protect him. However, the church preaches against what it calls superstition. The catechism used in the country districts describes the voodoo priest, the Hungan, as the principal slave of Satan. And men serve Satan by practicing magic and giving food offerings to the gods. Dr. Duvalier's police have entered churches and forcibly arrested priests and parishioners. He has expelled bishops. His tonton has massacred peasants and left them on church steps. Voodoo ceremonies, the sacrificing of bulls, have been held before the churches. Rome, in turn, has excommunicated President Duvalier. Still, throughout Haiti, voodoo would appear to be gaining strength and acceptance among the people. with its African origins, is a popular religion with emphasis on the comfort and support of a naive, poverty-stricken people. It has borrowed heavily from the Catholic ritual, and its adherents see little wrong with being a Catholic and practicing voodoo. Sociologists claim that people who regret this might consider the hard life of the peasants. They ask more that the gods remove their miseries than that they should give them riches and happiness. At this ceremony in a sanctuary in the hills, the Hungan, was to make contact and be processed by Dumbala Wido, the snake god, and of Catholic origin, the war god, Saint Jacques. Voodoo, it's claimed, allows the peasants to make contact with the supernatural, an exalted feeling. The Hungan becomes possessed, a vehicle of his gods, and the gods give advice. 
It's the time of the peasant, a time in days gone to leave the world of slavery as the white man's beast.